Welcome to another version of Mobile Reasoning. This time, we're gonna be talking to a family member. You know him as Mr. Hidden Gems, but I know him as Andre Simpson. Well, you might know him as Andre Simpson also. But today, we're learning his story. So, welcome to Mobile Reasoning. Mr. Andre. Greetings, greetings. Blessings, man. Blessings, greetings. man. First of all, welcome to the family. Thank you very, very much. And thank you for being able to sit down with us and tell us your story. Mm -hmm. Now, we, we know you're Mr. Hidden Gems, right? And it, he came up with Hidden Gems and came to us and said, hey, what about doing this thing? It was a perfect idea and it has been going well. Thank so you, thank, thank you. you very much for that. You are from where? Born in Trelawney. Raised in Kingston and then spent some years overseas before returning to Jamaica. Okay, all right. You're born in Trelawney. How long were you in Trelawney and Kingston? How long were you in Jamaica before you migrated? I probably lived in Trelawney for like a couple months, then I migrated. Well, I, I oh, left. Oh, so you yeah, dropped out in Trelawney? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Drop out from home to, you know. So okay. Home birth, and okay. then I lived in Kingston for 13 years before migrating to the U.S. Okay, and when you went to the U.S., where did you go? I went to New York. New York, yeah. okay. What, what, what part of New York? Of Queens, New York? Queens. Concrete, concrete Jungle, Queens. Yeah, man, okay, Queens. all right. So the Queens Bridge, that's, yeah, you know yeah. all about that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, yeah. Good things, good Definitely. things. All you hip-hop fans, you know about Queens Bridge <laughs> um, and the controversy therein. But, um, all right, so you were in Queens and you did what, high school? So um, when I went to, um, to the States, I did did one term of junior high school okay. to kind of get an idea of where I'd be placed for high school. Yeah. Then I went to Springfield Gardens High School, which is a very, it's like a cultural mecca for high schools in Queens because okay. you have West Indians, you have Hispanics, you have whites, you name it, you have mm -hmm. black Americans. So um, it, it was a very interesting experience and it was actually known for, for being one of the worst high schools in Queens. But oh. However, whoever was there, we made it. We made it work, and we excelled regardless. You know, that's usually the story. When the worst high school is uh, blah blah blah, yeah. they always come up with the best people. Trust me, that diamond in the rough. Well, the rough. you are you are testament for diamond that. Um, sorry. So you went to Queens. You you um, graduated from high school. Mm -hmm. Um, what was your What was your experience during high school, though? How did you? Um, it was a. It was a. It was a culture shock in the sense that, like, when I first went, I was being called Iri, you know, Rasta, Iri, like, but I. I gradually adapted to the environment. I gradually adapted to the to the new norm of what I was living in. Yeah. Um, it was fun. And like I said, like in high school I was around a bunch of West Indians, so it wasn't like I was an outcast because mm -hmm. I was amongst my, my people per se in, okay. in high school. Okay. Um it was an interesting journey nonetheless. Interesting mm -hmm. journey. I always kept my good grades. But while while going to high school, I was plagued with some issues. I just stutter a lot. Stutter? Like, yeah, I had real real bad stutter issues. Um, which which was from from when I was yeah high. Okay. Um, that also stemmed from having low self esteem. Cause for me, growing up in the eighties, being dark skin wasn't a cool thing. Mm. So I was dark. I stuttered. So this caused anxiety issues. So I can recall one instance where I was, I was actually in a law class in high school and. All I had to do was go in front of the class and say one line. I'm gonna just start sweat, get oh. nervous, start stammering. I kept on saying, I plead the fifth. That wasn't the line enough, but I just kept on saying, I, I plead the fifth. And it was just a journey nonetheless, yeah. a journey that, that, I, that I embrace and I appreciate. So I noticed that you, you, you pause when you're speaking and, and yeah. you know, the, like it's almost like the stutter going start. Yeah, man, thing, so, but so for me, like I've just learned to just take my time and speak. Mm -hmm. That helps and, and trying to be at peace mentally while I'm speaking and I try to rush. Okay. So, so that definitely helps for me to reduce my stuttering. But those who actually know me from, from even a couple of years ago can, can attest that even as a grown man, like, it would be rough for me, yeah. but but here I am now. So, did you find that that held you back? Any? I mean, definitely. The um, se self-esteem, like the confidence, wasn't there. I actually heard Steve Harvey say something recently, and the issue with some stutterers is that because the person in front of you that you're speaking to knows that you might be stuttering, mm. that can affect you as the stutterer. Is <laughs> so, that right? Yeah, man. Yeah, man. 
because you you now are trying to not stutter, not stutter, and, and they are expecting you to stutter. Says so like you have that in your mind, like whoa, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So I've, I, you know, I've always wondered what goes through a, a person who is stuttering. Um, what is, is the sentence finished in their mind quick, and they're Both. telling yeah. themselves, no, just get it out, get it out. Is that is that what happens? Definitely, like. At times, it would be hard for me to even say say two words without stuttering. Two words back to back without stuttering. Wow. So, yeah. <laughs> so it was a fight mentally. Um, but at the end of the day, nothing happens before it's time. True. So just it's a matter of just riding out the storm and just appreciating the journey yeah. and just know that when you actually stop or when you improve, you'll be able to appreciate and em and embrace it even more. Yeah. So, yeah. Interesting. You know, it's funny how life teaches you these lessons. I mean, you've you've carried that lesson throughout your life definitely i mean that philosophy mm -hmm. has become your signature definitely, definitely you started with you started a program called overcomers yes which you can find on instagram uh, what is the instagram ha handle um so instagram handle is arthur andre l simpson on instagram and the youtube channel is higher thinker higher thinker yeah make sure you look for it he has a wonderful series called overcomers tell us a little bit about overcomers so the idea for me i just know that everybody has a story right and i just wanted in individuals to share their personal stories of how they've possibly overcome certain situation as a means to more so motivate and inspire others mm -hmm. so the idea came about and i had someone who agreed to to join me as a co-host and, and we completed about 30 about 30 something interviews we've nice. interviewed um individuals from all different areas in jamaica and and the diaspora mm -hmm. um and it's been great so far wonderful yeah. wonderful keep it up because we all need to expose the wonderful um stuff happening Definitely. with jamaicans all over mm -hmm. um all right so let's talk about what happened after high school you went to college okay yes yeah, so for me like growing up my, my my father was super duper strict so me i wanted i was yearning for my freedom Per se, mm. so I was determined to get away from home, whether it be go away to school. Initially, I was applying to colleges and I didn't get any scholarship offers. So mm. I, I was actually on the verge of joining the Navy. I took the test, but I didn't sign up. Um, a few weeks later, I actually got two scholarship offers to play football, soccer, mm. football in. Colorado and Kentucky. I agreed to go to Kentucky. So this was Barberville, Kentucky. Now, <laughs> for those who don't know, um, there are certain places in the United States <laughs> where black people are few and far between. Definitely. Kentucky and is one of those, and Barberville <laughs> is one of those places. Were you the only black person there? Ironically enough, um, most of the athletes were minorities well, that makes so sense. like for for even the football team the coach was from brazil so he would definitely source players from brazil players mm. from argentina jamaica and players you name it trinidadian players so majority of the athletes in at the school in the town were minority the town was unique in the sense that on weekends friday nights they literally like drive around the town in their car playing music and and that was a chill vibe for them like that was that their was their excitement that was their excitement no club no 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 like well they might have clubs like way out of the town but yeah. in the town in the town that was their enjoyment drive around the town play music and drink and just chill so <laughs> okay one particular incident when i first got to barberville mind you i, I come from new york my finally get me I, I finally got my freedom to go and roam i wanted to explore so when i first got there i went to this festival i'm not sure if you heard about the daniel boone festival before <laughs> all right um there's only one question yeah. i have for you yeah what <laughs> in the world were you doing at a daniel boone festival I was a young man, I was a young Jamaican coming from New York City. I didn't know nothing about Kentucky, much as Daniel Boone Festival, but I heard a festival was happening, so I wanted to go and explore <laughs> and, and have fun. Um, when I got to the festival, I saw faces that were unfamiliar. I, yeah, I <laughs> yeah. bet. Um, I bet. <laughs> if I was the only black person there, I wouldn't be lying. 
by saying that. Yeah. Um, so my coach actually asked my teammates, where, where's Andre? So when they actually told him where I went, he sent the entire team for me. Okay. And how long um, did you stay in Barberville? So I was in Barberville for a year. So after the first year, I just wanted to be closer to home. Like, okay. like my mother lived in Canada, my father lived in the city. So I said, okay, let me try and transfer to Buffalo. Okay. So I transferred to school in Buffalo and I was there for three years um it was it, so that's one plus three so this is your senior year now my senior year so okay it was an interesting experience um however while in my senior year i i came across well i experienced something uh -huh. that definitely shifted my life um tell us about massively. it so while in my final year of of university i was introduced to, to some individuals who were in involved in illegal stuff um okay selling drugs, robbing drug dealers, so forth. Okay. Um, I w th the idea was brought to me, and for lack of better judgment, I agreed. I agreed to take part. The worst mistake ever, yeah. right? Um, long and short of it. So you joined a group of people mm -hmm. who were robbing drug dealers mm -hmm. and selling the drugs back? Yes. Okay. And what, what were you doing in that group? I was more so the driver because I had a car. Oh, okay. So it, it was easier for them to move around okay. with my car, whatever the case uh. would be. So I, I was more so the driver okay. than okay. anything. Um, yeah, so we, we, we did it for like a, for like a few months. Mm -hmm. um, lo and behold, there were a lot of statements being, being made mm -hmm. against us. We mm -hmm. didn't know. And mind you, every single one of us, we were all university students. And this just... I'm sorry. Yeah. Wait. Yeah. <laughs> you all were, University. were you at Buffalo? Yes, so one was actually a graduate and the other three were actually currently enrolled in their senior or junior year at the university. So this shows a different side of what university life is and, and I, I think more, more people need to actually realize that guess what? In every facet of life, there is some good and there is some bad. Yeah. So just for you to just be mindful of it and if you have kids that's children that are in university, make sure you keep that line of communication open yeah. to ensure that they, they don't fall victim because it's easy to fall victim because you're away from home, mm -hmm. you're, you're experiencing your freedom and you have quote-unquote friends yeah. who can easily lead you astray. So it's definitely a good thing to keep that line of communication open with your child while they're away for school. All right, so when you were doing um, this extracurricular mm -hmm. stupid activity, stupid activity for sure, um, what happened? So there was a final incident, um, just like in the movies where, where um, so you might see like a drug dealer say, say that, well, this is the last hurrah, do it one more time and then out. So one of the individuals actually had a dream that he saw us behind bars. So we came together and we was like, you know what, we're gonna stop. Mm -hmm. We're not gonna do this no more. And then we agreed to do one last hurrah. That one last hurrah turned into a nightmare. Um, mm -hmm. Ended up in a high speed chase. Uh, being chased by Buffalo PD, almost got shot in my back. I can recall um, pulling over the car and, and hopping out the car and hearing freeze, but I didn't freeze because I was just, I wanted to get away. Like, it's so ironic that all that I was doing, I had no idea the seriousness of it mm -hmm. until I'm in it, I'm in the dude and get to realize, so I'm in the mess and get to yeah. realize like, this this real. So lo and behold, um, by, by the grace of God, I wasn't shot. Um, I actually escaped, so we were all actually out there um, on the run for a couple of days before we actually turned ourselves. In. But they had your car. They had my car, so. So you weren't, there's you didn't no, escape anything. There's no getting away. <laughs> so like, we, we were actually out on the news for a couple of days. Like, I'm sure. Yeah, and it was, it was terrifying, and at the same time, the most import, important thing I was thinking about the, the entire process was, what would my family and my friends and my loved ones think? Right, right, right. Because here I was in my senior year of university about to graduate and go to law school because I always wanted to be a lawyer. So, so the plan was to graduate in May, go to law school and, and be a lawyer. So here I was now in my final year of university about to be arrested and, and do some time. So I knew that the reception wouldn't be good. And that was one of the biggest issues for me, how my loved ones and my family members would feel and be affected yeah. by my bad decisions it's interesting but that um that you had these thoughts even though you were going through the roughness and you never really think about it until, until the roughness it. start Sorry. to come back at you exactly. because as long as it's running smooth you're thinking oh I'm we're, enjoying we're good it. i'm still enjoying the ride like for me i was actually hoping i would probably get like six months maybe yeah. a year and i can probably like 
like call him every now and again or send a letter right. to somebody yeah. so they wouldn't suspect much. But when I went to my first arraignment, my, my arraignment hearing, which is when you go in front of the judge for the first time to kind of understand the seriousness of, of your crime, I heard that I was facing 25 years for each charge my or for each count. So basically, I was facing up to, up to 75 years in prison. My so may hear that, me nearly drop, me not lie to you. Like, the 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 fantasy world I was living in of expecting said, so okay, well guess what? We can probably do a six months and tough it out and make it back out to my family afterwards. That was gone. That was gone. That was gone. So now I have to face the music and I had to reach out to my family and let them know what the situation was. Wow. So I wanna pause here and I wanna thank the Constant Spring Golf Club for allowing us access to their uh, their awesome green space. Also we want to say a special thank you to Express Fitness for allowing us to enter their hit factory. Now, this place is a place for no excuses. Definitely. Where you put up or you shut up. And that is a perfect example of what we're going to learn about Andre's life. Make sure you check out Express Fitness. The new place up here at the Constant Spring Golf Club is phenomenal. Let's get back to Andre. All right, so you learned some hard lessons. Definitely, definitely. You went on your first arraignment <coughs> and you were going, you're, you're up to 75 years potentially, potentially yes. to go to prison. Yes. Your knees buckle. Yeah, man, like, like reality hit. Reality hit and it didn't feel good. Of course not, <laughs> it, of course it, not. It, it what did you good. end up getting? What was your sentence? So, Towards the end of it, I basically was sentenced to six years in prison. Okay. So, mind you, first time ever being in trouble, first time ever being locked up, period. Um, before that, I never would have imagined spending one day in prison, much less years. Of course. But this was my new reality, and I had to deal with it. Right. Did you spend the, did you spend the full time, the full six? So, um, in, in New York State, you do 85% of your time. So, I did five years, two months, and 19 days, to be exact. Wow. Yeah. Okay. yeah, man, can't forget. <laughs> yeah, of course you can't forget can't that. Forget. What happened when your time was up? So while I was, while I was actually there, I, I developed my love for reading and writing. Mm -hmm. um, so I actually, I, I started writing books. Um, after my time was up, I was deported back to Jamaica. So okay. this happened in 2009. Okay. Um, for me, I was always adamant or determined to make my right, my wrong right. So I, I, I was determined to go back to school. This is what I knew before I got locked up. So when I came back to Jamaica in April, I learned that U.S. application process was closed off from December, January, but I was still determined to try nonetheless. So I got my transcript from, from the school I was attending and I applied for U.S. So I applied in May, got through in July, and started in September. Wow. Didn't know how me I got pay for it, but trust me, by the grace of God and some wonderful family members and loved ones, I was actually able to see myself through. When I first got back, one of my first jobs I actually got was working um, on a workshop, a one-year workshop that was sponsored by the European Union and, uh, and UNDP, okay. which was um, spearheaded by Professor Bernard Headley. So Bernard Headley is a criminologist, wonderful, awesome person. He actually died, um, but he believed in me. So I was introduced to him um, to a, by an organization that I was a part of, Fury, um, which is the founder is Carmita Ab Abras Lindo. She she's a psychiatrist, psychologist for um, the DC sniper. Okay. Leboy Marvel. So she has a passion for helping deported persons in Jamaica. So, um, yeah, so Prof Headley took me on and it was a wonderful experience. So when I came back, I was gifted the opportunity to have a decent job mm -hmm. upon returning home. And like I said, throughout the entire journey, like God has just paved the way for me in so many ways. Mm -hmm. So I, I just have to always big up God in, in everything because without him along this journey, it would be way worse than it, than it was. So you're back in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. You started school. Mm -hmm. You working with Professor Headley. And um, you you, you kind of see a difference around you. I mean, now you, is life smooth now? You're no, good man. to go. Um, actually, w when I first came back, I went to go live with a family member. Um, um, it was an experience and a half. I did six years in prison, and the only time I broke down was when I actually saw my father in the courtroom crying in front of a bunch of people. So it was this man I grew up seeing being strong. 
courageous, being that powerful father figure and I saw him break down in court. That's the only time I can recall breaking down. I didn't break down toward my time being incarcerated. So when I came back to Jamaica, I was just expecting to be around love and family. However, there's a stigma that surrounds deportees. Mm. When I say me experience it, me experience it, and me experience it from a family member. Okay. I was living with the family member for three months, and after the three months, she basically kicked me out. Oh. Um, so mind you, I, I was just accepted to you. I was supposed to start school the following month, but yes, still I'm kicked out with nowhere to go. Um, luckily, I was introduced to a cousin, so I went to go live with that cousin, and after that, I was gifted the opportunity to live on campus because mm -hmm. of my sports sports history. Okay. So I lived on Irving, big up the veterans, um, M1. <laughs> I have to big them up. And even with that, like coming back, I had to humble myself a lot. Mm. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the whole, um, the whole culture on campus and how we teach us. Tell, tell us. So, so like you have to go go to a particular phase of brotherhood. Mm. Um, so I was there, mind you. I just spent time in being incarcerated, and here I am amongst younger younger men than myself. And I humble myself, and I went through the whole process of being a part of the block mm -hmm. and it was a humbling experience and to this day i still i still maintain a certain bond with certain individuals i i experienced that process with mm -hmm. so it's a humbling process but it forms certain bonds so i definitely encourage anybody going to university um check it out it, to live on can, campus yeah, to be a campus person definitely, it can work for you okay um but I would always be on campus. Like whereas Christmas time, holidays, I'm saying might see people going home, I would be one of the persons that's stuck on campus. I didn't have anywhere to go per se. I mm -hmm. didn't really have family around me like that in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. I, I had some cousins, good cousins, but at the end of the day, as far as being able to go somewhere for like big um, holidays and stuff, I, I, I didn't have that option. So I was always on campus. Okay. Did you do um, extra jobs on, on yes, campus? Yes, man. Um, I worked at the gym, I worked at the library. I, I, I was working those two jobs for like two and a half years while going to UA. So wait, this is serendipitous that we're here yeah, at the Hit Factory. <laughs> uh -huh, and, and we're here with a physical trainer. Yes, yes, So, yes. so in other words, you're going to start with some push-ups and those things. Hit Factory, I am here. I am here. <laughs> so, so, okay, we're going to get it on camera. Him here at the Hit Factory doing some serious workout, right? We have some tires, we have boxes, <laughs> we have all kind of things set up here. and. You remember that there's no excuses. No man, no man, no excuses. No retreat, no surrender. No excuses. All right, so good. Man. We're going to make sure. You, yeah, all right, <laughs> good. So you did those those different odd jobs at yes. the. Um, well, it wasn't really an odd job, was it? It, it was, was a way to to make ends meet. Um, I wasn't given the option to get a student loan, mm -hmm. so I, I I had to either reach out to family members, loved ones, and at the same time I had to be working mm -hmm. to make sure. So guess what. I have finish. And you did finish? And I did finish. So I completed my degree in 2013. Okay. Which was a degree in political science. Political science. And and since then though, you've done a whole heap that's not political or science. <laughs> At all. Um, <laughs> I, since come back to Jamaica, I have self-published three fictional novels and two children's books. Along Pause. Yeah. Only hear that? Eh? Only hear that? Three fictional no novels and two children's books, self-published. Yes. So uh, you, you 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 publish these books, mm -hmm. and I mean, first of all, what 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 even got into you to even want to write books? So while I was incarcerated, I'd read a, a lot of books. Growing up, my father used to tell me, Andre, make sure you read a book a week. I read a book a month. Yeah. Never the life read, but. When I had all this time on my hands, like I wanted to get away from where I was presently at. Mm. So I did a lot of reading and in doing a lot of reading, I saw some books where people write and I'm like, if them can't write, why me can't write? True. So I wanted to challenge myself to actually write. So um, my first novel, which is High Rollers, is an urban fiction. So it basically t touches on stuff that I've experienced. So it was relatively easier for me to write. So this took me like six seven months to complete the first draft mm. i wanted to challenge myself for the second book so the second book is a serial killer mystery mm. so i said all right cool and i've read up a bunch a, a bunch of serial killers and watch a bunch of csi and nypd blue and <laughs> D, dean coons and james patterson so that was for me the most challenging book or one of my third book was trauma so it's t-r-a-u-m hyphen a 
this was actually written in the eyes of a woman. Oh. In the eyes of a woman? Yes, yes. So the main character was actually a woman. So you wrote <laughs> yeah. as from a woman's point of view? Yes, yes, yes. People, go get that book there. And when you get the book, come back <laughs> and comment if he got it right. Women, please, Let put him <laughs> put him to the test, okay? Please. All right, go ahead. Yeah, man. So, um, so that was three different types of books, and I still wanted to challenge myself more. So I have two kids. Um, so when COVID happened, the idea came to me then, do one for do a children's book for um, for my son. So the first book I did was Abba's Lessons Keeping Safe from Viruses. So it's just a fun way to kind of like educate the kids on how to keep safe from viruses. I didn't okay. say COVID. Yeah, I just yeah. kept it as just viruses. viruses. Yeah. Then I needed to do something for my daughter also. So it's kind of ironic, like me growing up. Dark skin, like I said, used to get called black, but you name it. I was called a bunch of names, and which led to me have, having low self-esteem. Mm. So my daughter being as dark as me, I wanted to do something for her to kind of like, and help other kids to enlighten them and show them, so well, guess what? Even though it might be of different shades, it's just important for us to love ourselves. So I enlightened them about melanin, the importance of skin color and loving who you are. So that's four little gems uniquely made. Wow. So those are my five books. So those are all on Amazon? Yes, They're all on Amazon. Anywhere else? Um, can um, you get it anywhere in Jamaica? Yes, the first two books, which I'll be redoing, um, are actually available at Monarch Pharmacy and York Pharmacy. Okay. But I'll be redoing those soon. W uh, soon? Okay. Yes. All right, so I'm I'm going to get the redone one. And most definitely. Mine yes. is going to be the autographed one. Yes, man, most and, definitely. And then um, he's going to put me in the credits. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I want you to jump back to mm -hmm. when you were in college because there were some some significant uh, assistance that you got mm -hmm. um, and some si significant accomplishments that you Definitely. had. So tell me about those. So one of the main ones was was when I came back um, being connected with Fury. So Fury is a nonprofit organization where they help deported persons in Jamaica. So the founder of Fury, along with Miss Brown actually introduced me to Prof Headley. Mm -hmm. While doing a workshop with Prof Headley, um, we actually founded a, a non-profit ourselves, which is National Organization for Deported Migrants. Okay. So I was one of the founders of that program. However, because I was in school, I couldn't really focus on it. Mm -hmm. So I was just one of the founders and then they actually branched out to, to take on is that yeah. organization still going on now? To my knowledge, yes, it is. Okay. To my knowledge, okay. yes, it is. National? National Organization of Deported Migrants. Okay. And then if you guys need help also, please reach out to Fury. Fury is a very, they play a very important role with, with trying to help persons who have come back to Jamaica, who have okay. been deported to Jamaica. Okay. Yeah. Cool. We're going we're gonna to make sure we put um, Fury's uh, information in, in here in the description. Definitely. And uh, we'll look to see if the National Organization of Deported Migrants is is still is still available and we will put the information in the description yes all right cool so now you have written these books you are an acclaimed author right. um, um i even gonna say bestseller <laughs> <laughs> um, but you have you went on to start to do instagram yes oh man so i've always had an instagram platform but I've always struggled with promoting my own work, mm -hmm. which I'm, I've just actually been creeping out of that shell hey, to look, promote my own work. You're in the hit factory, you know? Yeah. No so excuses. no excuses, you know? Definitely. Right? Definitely. So them days, they're done. done yeah. Right? From once we come here, we know the mindset that you have to be in mm -hmm. is absolutely no excuses Excuse. and you must get the things no, done. No, you have to push, man. Um, All right. At the end of the day, the, the, push is, the push is most important. And, and for me, it's just keeping in mind and sharing with the audience also that your past doesn't have to definite, doesn't have to define your future and should not define your future. Mm. Your past should basically help you to get to where you are now and prep you for where you are going to be in, in the future. That's so, right. just, so that's just a mentality and definitely no excuses. So um, along the way, I've actually helped about 12 to 13 individuals actually self-publish their own books. Wow, nice. Yeah, for, and for me, it's a joy to, to help others to see that or come to that realization that guess what, I am an author. So how, 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 would, how would they mm -hmm. get in contact with you to get the help to self-publish? Um, my IG, you can reach out to me at author Andre L. Simpson on Instagram and I'll definitely add my phone number um, so you guys can reach out to me via um, telephone also if need be. All right, good yes. to go, good to go. Andre, your story continues. Definitely. Now you're doing hidden gems mm -hmm. 
and I want you to explain to the, the masses. Tell us about hidden gems. So the idea came about because I know for a fact that there are individuals there who have the talent, have the gift, but they just need the right to exposure. Mm -hmm. um, someone once said, everybody will have the gift or the talent, but it's not having it enough. It's who you get to connect with to mm -hmm. help to get that out there. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to provide a platform for people to just help them to get the push they need to kind of propel them to where they need to be. Mm -hmm. So that's where the idea came about. To kind of backtrack a bit, before COVID, I never did an IG live. I, I was always that shy person still stuck in a shell. Mm. But COVID happened and a lot of changes happened. And I know I, I had to find creative ways to change with the time. So I started Arthur's Corner. So Arthur's Corner is where I interview authors locally and in the diaspora, US, Canada, you name it. And they come and they share their work, their passion for writing. And then it transitioned from Arthur's Corner to Overcomers. And now here I am doing Hidden Gems. So, wow. yeah man, God is awesome. And it's just, I, the most important thing is just keeping him at the helm. Mm. Understanding your true purpose and just going with the flow of things and just trusting God at the same time. Yeah man, I love it, I love it. People look out for Hidden Gems on Good News Jamaica, whether on our Facebook page or Instagram page or our YouTube channel. Um, also look out for future writings by Andre Definitely. because he will be doing some articles for Good News Jamaica um, and he will continue to do the wonderful interviews that he has been doing all the time. Andre, thank you very much yeah. and welcome to the family. Definitely, I appreciate it. We look forward to everything you're going to be doing and um, we're here to support you. We're here to cheer you on, we're here to celebrate with you. But most importantly, we're here to collaborate Definitely. with getting you way past where you could ever think you could be. Appreciate you understand? It. Appreciate so big up yourself. And welcome, my bro. Appreciate it. Yeah, man. Blessings. All right, folks. That has been another episode of Mobile Reasoning. I am Charles Hyatt, and this is Andre Simpson, the great until such time stay blessed i remember no excuses thank you for checking us out on good news jamaica tv for content that informs inspires and transforms please like share leave a comment subscribe and hit the notification bell for more positive Jamaica content. What good?